Welcome to worship. Did you know that we filmed this earlier in the week? And today it's cloudy and windy and not so great outside. But I hope wherever you are on this day that the weather is beautiful because it's always a beautiful day when we can gather to worship and to pray and to sing and to praise God together. Let's be church. Well, you said that I, 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 I can be anyone that I want to. This was true. But tell me why is it that time I go and try, you're always bringing me down, down to the ground, and I go, da 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 da
You might not remember that almost a third of our Bible is poetry. I don't mean a third is poetic. I mean it's literally versed out poetry. And we're about to turn to the 65th chapter of Isaiah and it's verses of ancient Hebrew poetry and it's beautiful. You'll hear in this poem about a new creation. When God brings all things to culmination, you'll hear about God's joy, the joy God takes in us. You'll also hear this yearning for economic justice, that we could live fairly with one another where everyone thrives. And you'll hear about nonviolence. There will be a world where no one will harm anyone anymore. Listen to this poem. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives only a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. Or one that dies at a hundred years will now be considered just a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant their own vineyards and eat their fruit, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat the food. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their own hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord. And their descendants blessed as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent and its food will all be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy one another on my holy mountain. Here ends God's poem. One of the things that scripture reminds us often, all the time actually, is that though we tend to think of spirituality as something otherworldly, as something kind of nebulous, uh, kind of up in the air, as something that's in the realm of that which is uh, esoteric and unable to be known, th that in actuality, spirituality is, is, is who we are and, and that is deeply embedded in an, in an incarnate way of being in the world. Uh, this is central to our story of faith, a, a divine life who became human and dwelt among us. Uh, and so, so we need that reminder often and, because we can easily get a certain sense of detachment from the reality of our everyday life and think that somehow this detachment, this, this sense of the holiest other is kind of helpful. Well, well it's, it's really not helpful. What is helpful is what Scripture reminds us of over and over again, which is that, that this sense of spirituality, this sense of a, of a God who comes on the earth, this sense of a God who cares about the day-to-day -day life matters today in this very moment. And there's no better example of, of this reality for us in Scripture than the writings of the prophets. And we have a prophet that we hear from today in this case, the prophet Isaiah. See, prophets had the gift of being able to see the reality of the world right before them. The reality of the people that they were living around, uh, the reality of their own community, and see how that reality didn't match 
the reality that God wanted for that community. Uh, so, so God, uh, the, the energy of love in the world, uh, God, that divine life uh, beyond all of our understanding, God, that, that unifying uh, spirit uh, that lives within us and throughout all creation, that this God wants for us, according to our own scriptures, wholeness, uh, shalom, uh, integration, completion, uh, uh, healing, new life, and abundance for all of creation, for all of humanity. And so the, the, the prophet looked around and, and began to recognize that, that, that there was something missing, that, that the world around them among their neighbors and friends and loved ones didn't match that reality. And, and so then the prophet's call is to speak that reality to those in power, to those that might have some ability to make the reality of their kin better. Now, that means that those prophets were constantly getting into trouble, right? And, and in fact, all of them in the tradition ended up dying because of their loud mouths, because of their constant annoyance to the system. But what they say matters deeply because they give us a vision. They gave the communities that they first wrote about and talked about a vision, and they give us a vision. And today's vision is a vision very much so in the midst of the lives of these Israelites who were hearing these oracles, this word of the Lord. And it's a vision that reminds all of us right here where we are in this very moment of what God wants for all of us. And this is a God who cares deeply about our day-to-day -day life. This is a God who cares deeply about human community and creation. This is a God who cares deeply about the ways in which we care for one another and we love one another and how we can become beacons of hope for one another. This is that kind of God. And the vision of the prophet reminds us of this over and over again. Did you hear about a, a, new, a new creation? Did you hear uh, about a, a circumstance where children could live a long life? Uh, did you hear it? A, a circumstance in, in, which, in which folks wouldn't be grieving anymore, in which folks would, would find abundance again? Did you hear it? A, a situation in which older folks are not just living into old age, but are living into old age abundantly and with joy? Uh, did you hear it? A, a, a city that has all the resources that folks need to live lives of completeness and fullness and abundance. Did, did, did you hear that vision? Sometimes when we hear it in the midst of our lives, we, we get a bit uncomfortable, don't we? We, like the prophets of old, look around our neighborhoods. I think about this often when I walk the streets of near south. And I, and I put the, this vision against what I'm seeing around me. And sometimes the gap, it's huge. And it's easy to get hopeless. And so it's a lot easier to step back, to dissociate, and make that vision something that's spiritual, not in the sense of embodied and real, but in the sense of otherworldly and, and never to, to be able to be found a utopian, dreamy, impossible, uh, something so detached from ourselves. And maybe we do that because we, we get so heartbroken and so hopeless that we don't know what to do. So today I am inviting you to do the total opposite. In other words, the prophet speaks to us today and speaks to us with power and reminds us to get rerooted in our neighborhoods, rerooted in our communities, rerooted in our homes, and begin to see the possibility for abundance, the possibility for new life, the possibility for love having the, the last word. It's an invitation for us not to get so hopeless, but to kind of roll out of bed in the morning and, and see ourselves once again engaged 
in the day-to-day -day life of our neighbors, where they are and where we are, and to begin to see there, in the midst of that messiness of life, possibility, hope, new life, to begin to dream dreams and see visions like the ancient prophets and to, to know that, that no matter how difficult this moment gets, and these moments can get quite difficult, that the Spirit of God is still at work in the world. So what would it look like for the children in your neighborhood to live long, abundant life? What, what are the, the, the pieces that they need for them to live long, abundant life. What pieces are needed for the elderly around you, not just to live to old age, but, but, but to begin to live to old age in ways that are abundant, in ways, in ways that are full, in ways that honor their dignity as elders in our midst? What would it look like for our cities to be prosperous, not due to financial resources or, or tall buildings, but, but, but successful and abundant in the ways of kinship and community together. What would it look like for a new creation to emerge from under our feet by the ways in which we are shifting our imaginations together? What would it look like if we, like Isaiah, we root ourselves in our circumstance, as real as that is, in the midst of the, the brokenness and despair and anger and struggle. And that reality then births in us a new imagination, not just for us, but for all people around us. And, and not just right here in the, in the corners around 20th Street and, and D, but but where you live, where, where you work, uh, where you shop, uh, where you engage others, what would it look like there where you are to, to begin to see seedlings of hope and new life? And, 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 then, and then what does it look like for us together to, to imagine together a new future? As you know, I'm a confessed idealist. The prophets always speak deeply to me. But one of the reasons why they speak to me is because I believe that they still can shake us into a new reality. That, that, that discipleship, our following of Jesus, actually puts us straight in the middle of life, actual life, this life that we have, and calls us to, to see in that life uh, the possibilities of that shalom that God promised long ago. And that together, we as spiritual community, in our worship, and in our service, uh, in our care for one another, we then rehearsed that reality of new life week to week, day to day, month to month, year to year. This is a, a long-term commitment to the good of the city that we live in, our neighborhoods, our co-workers, uh, our, our fellow workers, our, our, even our enemy, and that together then, in these ways, we, even if we for a moment, can be agents of reconciliation, good news, new life, salvation, healing, wholeness, integration. We agents of shalom. We agents of a, the new day that we are promised by God. We, we, like Jesus, walking and talking and healing and teaching, we extending our hand and welcoming, we going to the margins and seeing life and light, we, we rooting ourselves where God has called us, home, yes, home, and allowing for the Spirit of God to use us, to give a taste of heaven, eternal life, to the world that needs it most. Ah, people of God, that's love incarnate. So let us go and do that today. 
dream dreams and see visions of a new day together. Thanks be to God. Amen.
people of God, today I'm inviting you into the prophet's chamber to hear that vision of being this kind of community together, engaged in the world. So I'm wondering if you today are feeling a call in your heart to become a, a part of that community, to become a member of this body called First Plymouth, uh, us committed together to this life. So if you want to be make First Plymouth your home base for this kind of life, uh, click on the website and you'll find what you need to, to join us in this effort together. And then go, go into the world and be peace and life and love. The world needs it. The prophet calls, pay attention. Let's do this, amen. Churches all over our land were disrupted by the pandemic. We had to pivot to the digital realm and now people attend physical worship less regularly, but our vital ministries continue. The visiting of hospitals, shut-ins, those in need, all our service to the wider community, our educational programs, and all of this relies on pledges, your gift to the church. Now we've sent out those old school pledge cards and hope you fill that out if you got one, or you could just go to our website. But now is the time to prayerfully consider making a gift to the church or estimating what you can give in the next year because the ministry, the ministry of Christ must continue.